This is the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey, and today we'll be discussing addressing the stress of life transitions through ketamine with Dr. Arsalan Azam. Dr. Azam is medical director and founder of Daydream MD. Now, before we get to our chat with Arsalan, just a reminder that the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing here is to be construed as medical or legal advice. And one last reminder, as always, if you are a clinician and you'd like to learn more about psychedelic medicines and how perhaps they could help your patients, please join us at the Psychedelic Medicine Association, where it is our mission to educate you so that you feel comfortable having those conversations and referring patients to psychedelic practitioners when appropriate. You can find us at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. All right. Welcome, Arsalan. Thank you, uh, Lynn Marie. Thank you for having me on the podcast. It's such a pleasure. I'm very excited about our chat today because I think a whole lot of people are going to be very interested in this topic. A lot of times we talk about things with you know DSM diagnosis and depression and PTSD, but I'd say more commonly what your average person is dealing with may be the stress of different life transitions and things that they haven't gotten some kind of formal diagnosis for, but they may be wondering, is there a psychedelic option that may help me deal with these transitions? And as you have brought up, you um, work with ketamine in your practice, and that is one of the legal options that is more readily available for people who may be going through those transitions. Can you tell us a little bit, just for some background, about the kinds of um, patients that you've seen in your practice and maybe some of the different life transitions that you've seen ketamine be helpful with? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things I'll preface all this by saying is right now, ketamine is the legal tool we have available. I do think other psychedelics are going to slot in well for these purposes. And given certain types of life transitions versus others, some psychedelics might be superior to ketamine in the future for specific things. I do think ketamine will continue to have a role in spite of that. So I'll just preface this whole conversation with that. And yeah, we see a diverse um, group of patients at um, Daydream MD here in San Diego. Um, we see a decent number of patients who fit your classic ketamine clinics criteria of treatment resistant depression and anxiety. These are folks who've been on three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, first line antidepressant medications, which are considered appropriate doses for appropriate lengths of times, and they've had inadequate responses or no response, or they've had excessive side effects. So I'd say we see maybe about a third of our patients fit that criteria. Um, another third of our patients are often coming in because they're coming in with specific work due to a life transition that they'd like to do. Um, and so they seek us out because we are very forward with addressing that need as well as incorporating ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And then finally, I'd say a whole nother third of our patients are often doing it as a touch point to like continue to optimize. Um, they, they've done work previously and they're in a good place, but they know that they can do better. And so they'd like to continue to optimize their uh, mental health. So um, I would describe that as our, our overall patient mix. And in terms of demographics, we see everyone. We see patients as young as 12 as old as 80, um, men, women, veterans, LGBTQ, BIPOC, lots of different populations with their own unique needs. And can you talk about some of those within those populations, some of the more common life transitions that bring people stress that leads them to seek out your, um, your totally. clinic and, and some, some therapies? Absolutely. And I'll add one more population that I think should be mentioned. We also do a number of donation-based medicine circles, and we do a decent number of write-offs. And the reason I mention that is I think there are populations that wouldn't normally have access to ketamine. And so we're seeing some interesting stories come up with those patients um, with their outcomes. It's not a huge number, but there is a decent number. Um, but your question was... Uh, Life transitions. What, what are some of the more common ones? Yeah, some of the things that... So let me give you an example of one of our first patients. And I think this is a huge need. And a lot of people in psychedelics are excited about it. And I think we've already seen in our practice how it can be used. We had a patient who was going through the dying process. She had been diagnosed with an advanced stage cancer and had been admitted to a cancer award here locally um, some time back. And she was experiencing a high level of death anxiety. The woman had a baseline of some predisposition. I would call her generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and then it additionally would occasionally get into episodic depression that would sometimes last for six months to a year, but was generally doing well until she found out that she might be dying. Um, and was inpatient for a month during her inpatient course, was put on Xanax because that's typically a reflexive first 
move is a benzodiazepine for acute relief of anxiety, which it is a great tool and it does work really well. But she was on Xanax three times a day to the point where she was getting sedated. And so they added Adderall to keep her awake during the day, which is an interesting combination of gas and brakes. So her daughter was concerned. She's like, look, I just don't feel like my mom's even here anymore. Um, and so reached out to, about ketamine therapy. And so we got this patient into ketamine therapy. We did it a pretty quick turnaround from assessment to getting her in the chair within about 72 hours because this was a patient in an acute distress, um, not suicidal, nothing like that, but just in a lot of pain. It was hard to live life day to day. And so we got her in for a treatment. And within about 48 hours of her treatment, this patient was doing much, much better with her death anxiety. It wasn't gone. Um, it wasn't resolved. This was an ongoing issue, but she had a better relationship with it. She was able to put it on the shelf in at times when she wanted to spend time with her grandchildren, when she wanted to connect with her family members, and also just do basic activities of daily living. And so she's able to continue to like negotiate this dying process and really think about what dying meant and like integrate that, but in a way that was more comfortable. And a big part of that was ketamine, you know, Part of the science of ketamine is that it does tend to downregulate emotional responses from the amygdala. And this is how we see it show up for people in transition life. And we'll touch on this again and again with other examples. But instead of having an immediate degree of emotional reactivity to a standard stressor, they might be able to have some space to take a moment and opt for a different reaction in that moment because their amygdala is basically turned down. It's like taking the volume from 10 to 5 on that. So that's how it showed up for that patient. I have numerous other examples I can share as well. And so, and I like how you've integrated the fact that a lot of these transitions uh, come to people who may have a baseline, like you said, she had a baseline of general anxiety and they may just heighten whatever the baseline state was. And so it's interesting for um, you to be discussing how ketamine can help with when that base, you know, it may, like you said, people come with anxiety to your clinic all the time, but when that baseline is turned up, in these stressors, it's also helpful. Can you remind us some of the, you know, like just to touch back on some of the things that ketamine has been studied for that sometimes reappear during these difficult transition states like you, like anxiety? Yeah, I think one of the, the big things just to like frame the overall discussion, I'm sure it's been talked about, but I'll just do a quick dive on it. All our standard mental health medications right now are largely focused on modulating in like monoamines like serotonin, dopamine, or epinephrine, et cetera. Ketamine works at the NMDA receptor and mod modulates glutamate levels, um, which are often disrupted in brains exposed to stress, both acutely and chronically. Um, and those uh, disruptions are associated with depression, anxiety, and other things. And so I, there's increasing investigation into is, is there a glutamate hypothesis of depression as opposed to a monoamine hypothesis of depression? And so where we see ketamine go to work for these patients is it very quickly starts to reduce glutamate levels. It increases levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor in these folks' um, brains. And we start to see different, like it affects different parts of the brain differently. So activity in the HPA axis, which can be associated with emotional reactivity and other things. And if I'm getting too sciencey, stop me. But that can get turned down. And then their frontal cortex will start to operate differently um, as they're going through this. And so there's like a very real neurobiology that we're leveraging to use this as a tool for these patients. And the magic of this neurobiology is Unlike our existing tools, which take weeks to kick in often, this one works within like hours. And so it, it really becomes more of like a rescue medication or a supportive medication for these transitions of life that works quickly. And I think another thing that's worth mentioning is that in the fact, not only does it work quickly, but you don't generally have to taper off whatever medications you're taking, correct? Like you, your patients can stay on most of their antidepressants. Yes, if that's, that's, if that's the situation they're in. Yeah, if they are on antidepressants. And even for folks who might not be, might not have a background of any depression, anxiety, and might not be on any medications, but for the ones who do, it's great. It plays well with those meds. And then for the ones who don't, it still works. Yeah, absolutely. So in these life transitions, we might see, um, like you said, the glutamate helps with these brains that are chronically or acutely stressed. But we know that um, ketamine is really effective on, like you said, treatment resistant depression. Can you talk about sometimes that, you know, for example, some life transitions that you've helped people with where depression may have been what flare, you know, it's very easy to see where anxiety may flare up at the end of life. How about things like life stresses, like divorce or loss of a job that may cause, you know, like an acute grief or a depression flare? Yeah. So I can give you um, an example of a patient who I think is like kind of a model patient um, that 
of how to use ketamine in this way. Um, this patient had initially gone through treatment at another clinic um, for uh, an induction series of six treatments because they were just going through a lot of identity issues related to their job and relationship. Um, and so they went through an additional induction series, did really well, didn't need ketamine again for about six months. And then they used a touch point of two sessions over uh, a summer because another acute psychosexual stressor came up. And again, they used ketamine, they leveraged it, they did therapy with it, and they dealt with that stressor. Now, like about six months after that, they're coming to my clinic. Um, they're transitioning care. And again, this time it's the end of a relationship. And this isn't a patient who's necessarily been chronically depressed or anxious. She's an extremely high functioning um, person who is like a successful professional, but has recognized that they can do better with these transitions, leveraging this tool along with therapy. And so that's how this professional has been using it. And so now they're coming into my clinic for another three to four sessions. As they navigate a breakup, they want to do it mindfully in a way that can preserve the relationship to whatever extent they can. And so I think that's like a, a great example of this. Yeah. And you brought up something there that I think is worth dissecting a little bit because while you and I were chatting before we started recording, you mentioned that some people in these life transitions have been helped with ketamine assisted psychotherapy and others have been helped just by the ketamine alone. And so, as you mentioned in that patient, um, he had augmented ketamine alongside his therapy. Can you discuss a little bit about when you may, um, in these life transitions, stressful times, decide to do ketamine with therapy versus without? Yeah. So I, I'm a wild from a proponent of ketamine assisted therapy if you have a good therapist and if you can afford it, right? That's the big issue is cost. It's cash pay. These folks are in demand and typically are charging premium rates. So I'll just preface it by saying I think everyone generally benefits from ketamine assisted therapy. That said, though, I'll take a step back and let's just use this analogy about how psych psychedelics work in this instance of transitions of life. Think of our minds and our mental patterns as a piece of cold steel. Uh, and it's kind of locked in that structure, in that pattern. Psychedelics like ketamine and others can heat that steel up and make it much more moldable. And then when it cools back down, it'll maintain a persistent new structure. So ketamine-assisted therapy is a tool that helps us leverage that hot piece of steel to mold it into something else. That said, though, a lot of patients have a very strong practice of mindfulness and mental health already coming into our practice. And so they can often leverage that on their own. Um, they don't necessarily need ketamine-assisted therapy and will be successful independent of that. That said, I feel like a good ketamine-assisted therapist is always going to help you leverage further and do better with that. But I've also seen a lot of people be very successful on their own, independent of that. And irrespective, whether or not you might benefit from ketamine-assisted therapy, it's better than no ketamine to na navigate these things often. Yeah. And you actually just brought up something that I want to ask about, hopefully it's not too off topic, but um, for those who are doing ketamine without specifically a ketamine assisted therapy, do you still recommend they do some type of integration? I always do. And I think this is one of the big things that everyone in the field is trying to figure out is best practices and what are protocols. And I think eventually what I'm looking at is look, ketamine assisted therapists are highly trained and they're always going to be expensive as they should be. Um, it, it requires a lot of training. It requires a lot of energy. I feel like a full-time ketamine assisted therapist might not be able to practice much more than 25 hours a week because it is exhausting. Um, I'm an ER doc and I feel like that about emergency medicine, uh, 40 hours is way more than full-time for me a week because it's exhausting. And so I, what we're working on in my own practice and many people are working on is who actually needs a ketamine assisted therapist? What is the level of care? Someone with chronic sexual trauma, and this is separate from treatment resistant depression, but somebody with chronic sexual trauma who might be having a transitional life and is coming in, that's someone I'm going to put with a ketamine assisted therapist. That's, they're worth the money there because that is a high level need. But somebody going through something more general, um, maybe the loss of a relationship, maybe they're going through a crisis related to their sexuality, maybe an adolescent who's exploring their sexuality. Someone like that might do really well with a facilitator as well as a peer support specialist. And what I'm sort of conceptualizing in my mind is a pyramid structure where you have ketamine assisted therapists at the very top. They're the absolute experts. But then under them is another layer of facilitators. And these can be people like clinicians, NPs, nurses, MDs, other folks, other healing art professionals who are trained specifically in facilitation, who can provide a high level of services, um, but also have a clear scope of practice beyond which, okay, we need to escalate your care to a ketamine assisted therapist. And then on a bottom layer, and this the bottom layer is not mutually exclusive with either of the first categories, and maybe we should just put it as a parallel thing, of peer support, where a lot of us, a lot of, I think, people's acute issues as well as chronic issues are often related to social isolation. 
and not feeling like they can relate to other people going through what they're going through. And so peer support is a magical thing then. If you're a veteran dealing with PTSD, meeting another veteran who's trained in some basic facilitation, maybe not the same level as a facilitator, but basic peer support skills, who can understand you, hear you, and reflect back to you how they've successfully navigated these things. If you're a teenager navigating your sexuality and you're discovering you might be non-binary or you have a non-standard identity, um, they can help you navigate that as well. And all sorts of different identities where, you know, you might not identify with the general public. I do think there's a huge role for peer support. And so I think to answer your question is, what was the question again? Just remind me, just make sure I'm getting the right one. <laughs> To answer the question I've totally forgotten is, um, I, I think the question was something about, oh, integration. Like if somebody- Yeah, so integration. So I think, I think in general, there's a lot of avenues for integration. You can do ketamine assisted therapy. You can work with a facilitator. You can work with peer support. And then there's a whole world of other tools that people are working on right now. Folks are working on journals. People are working on VR headsets and VR worlds to navigate integration. So I think there's going to be a lot of exciting possibilities, ecotherapy music therapy, there's going to be a lot of modalities and there's going to be a lot of sorting out for what's the best practices. But if we're talking about traditional talk therapy and facilitation models, I do think you can work with a facilitator or a peer support person like Fireside provides for free on their hotline. Yes. Plug for Fireside Project 6-2 Fireside and download the Fireside app. I believe Josh is probably one of the next guests we're having on for his third time around because we love Fireside Project. Never forget that there is a peer support hotline out there. Put that on your phone if you are ever journeying, et cetera. And like you pointed out, you don't have to be journeying. They are there for integration. If you, you know, two weeks after your session, you, you want somebody to check in and discuss something with, they are there. So thank you for getting the fireside plug in. Um, another area that I wanted to talk about is the, you know, there is, if you could talk a little bit about the research on ketamine for suicidality, because I think the stress of life transitions, I, I mean, I don't know the stats on this, but I would imagine that this is a time when people may be more at risk for um, having suicidal ideation. Yeah, and I'm so glad you asked that question, Lynn Marie, because I think that really strikes to the heart of how we can institute a fundamental sea change in the way that our mental health system works, where right now people will get to suicidality and then it's like, oh, now you're a candidate for ketamine therapy in the current modality. But it's like suicidality really exists on a continuum. And on that continuum, let's use throughout the diagnosis adjustment disorder, which is not a great diagnosis. I don't want to pathologize what is just life for a lot of people. When someone dies, that's not adjustment disorder, that's loss. Uh, and you're going to have a hard time adjusting to that for a long time, more than the standard definition of whatever, like three months or something. Um, and so if you let like something, quote unquote, adjustment disorder fester, that is on a spectrum of suicidality that is eventually going to become suicidality. So rather than waiting for suicidality to become a thing before we might intervene for a transition of life, why not move ketamine up sooner so we can head that off at the pass and deal with it before it becomes something where someone's thinking they're in so much pain, the only way I can solve this is by not being here anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. And can you talk a little bit about some of, because I just want to remind anybody out there who may be curious about some of what research has found regarding how effective ketamine can be for suicidality. Yeah, so ketamine, again, the big um, drawback, I think, in a lot of traditional like mental health and psychiatric circles is considered that it's, um, tr it is a temporary effect of two to four weeks. But the flip side of that is ketamine works very quickly to reduce suicidal thinking. And its degree of effect is directly cor corresponds with the um, degree of symptoms. So someone who has really severe suicidality is more likely to experience a response to ketamine, is more likely to experience a significant response to ketamine. An example of this in my practice is I had a gentleman who had a PHQ-9 of 27 when he saw me. Um, and he Tell was everybody having what thought, the maximum is. Uh, it's, I think it's like 30 or something, but it's like right there at the top. And so this he was having top. Scale. Yeah, sorry. It's a state. It's a basic measure of depression, and that's really bad. That was a really depressed patient who want, was having thoughts of hurting himself, was contracted for safety, didn't have a plan, had never attempted it before, but came in for ketamine treatment. And within... I'd say about 10 days, we did another instrument. His score had dropped by half. Um, wow. And just talking to the patient, we didn't do a survey like two days after, three days after. His mood had improved within about 72 hours. Very nice. I had I remember what even when I just first started learning about psychedelics that somebody described ketamine and the reason that it was so effective for those um, experiencing suicidal ideation is because generally if you've gotten to that point, it has been possibly a long time since you've had any moments of joy. 
And very often these ketamine experiences can have some sense of euphoria. And that may be the first time that you've experienced joy in a while. And it's like a reminder, oh, that is possible. It is not beyond me to experience joy. Maybe life, let's, let's give life a, a, you know, another try for a period of time and see if we could bring myself back to, to experiencing joy. Is that something that some of your patients have expressed anything along those lines as to yeah. why it seems to be so effective? Yeah, apart from like just the sterile discussion of like, hey, the suicidality scores get better and whatnot, I think one of the things that sometimes folks are like uncomfortable talking about, patients often ask with guilt, is it okay that I feel good in my sessions? And I always tell them, look, the goal is ketamine is a scaffolding with which we're going to like remember how to feel good and develop the tools to feel good again. Uh, and so that's okay. That's actually encouraged. We, uh, As you just pointed out, um, Lynn Marie, oh, this is the first time some of these people might have felt good in months or years or even decades. Um, and so we totally encourage that. And I do think that is a powerful part of the healing experience is to have that sort of chemical assist just to take you to a happier place for a little while, even if it's only 45 minutes or two hours. And then subsequently, you also get a very real mood boost coming out of it. Yeah. Um, and I know that in your practice, you do a lot of group ketamine uh, sessions. Um I, and I, like you, like you had said, sometimes you do those by okay. Here's the the LGBTQ plus group or the the group for healers. Can you talk a little bit about how perhaps um, those sessions facilitate even more of the healing of somebody? Like you said, if they're in a life transition, for example, with their sexuality, and they get to do the ceremony with other people who may be going through similar types of things, can you talk a little bit about what might be some of the like that you've seen some of the added benefit of that group setting? Yeah. So you were asking like, how do you do integration maybe without ketamine assisted therapy? Um, and so this is one of the ways that integration happens. In integration isn't just about therapy. Integration can be simply being aware that there's someone else going out, out, out there going through what you're going through. And so we're going to be putting together more cohorted groups of things like veteran, of LGBTQ, of you know things like possibly postpartum depression, other very specific diagnoses where you can connect with other people who share your experience. And simply that connection of sharing an experience and it starts with the ketamine journey itself. Everyone's sharing that journey together. And they come out of that journey in a very open-hearted space. And they are talking about their shared experiences, which often people don't realize how many other folks are going through. And just simply having that knowledge that they're part of a tribe, they're part of a community that has the same suffering. And sometimes they're relating to people who might be a little further along in their journey of recovering from that. That is, I think, deeply, deeply powerful. I was just wondering, this just popped into my head and, and feel free to say, no, absolutely there aren't. But I was just wondering if there are any specific life transitions that even with ketamine um, seem to be a, a little stickier. Like maybe it takes more sessions of ketamine or you've just found in your practice, they, they just, it, it's like a slower slope to get better. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, some of the things like ketamine does have dissociative effects. So um, acute sexual trauma, as a life transition, I would not reach for ketamine as the first drug in the drug box as a potential tool for that, because you might be dissociating that person back into a state where they're reliving their trauma. That's a very touchy thing to approach. Even with chronic sexual trauma, you have to be very careful approaching these patients with ketamine. And I think there's going to be other diagnoses as we do more of this work and honestly just gain clinical experience. We're going to realize ketamine is not the first tool. And this is, I think, a lot of the work that needs to be done in the field is figure out which psychedelic for which patient at which time when they're going through a transition of life. Yeah, that makes total sense. And in a lot of these, like, let's say the people who are coming for the life transition only and not for like the underlying depression or anything else, what does a typical um, ketamine schedule look like for them? I realize it yeah, probably varies, but just maybe some different examples. Yeah. So an example, and by the way, all of this, we're working on validating this with data internally and eventually publishing papers to really figure out what works um, in terms of best practices. But for now, typically folks coming in for a transitional life without a background of mood symptoms, we're recommending three to four ketamine treatments, ideally spaced once a week. If they want to do very intensive work and they have the time, the space, and the energy, we might have them go on a twice a week schedule for two weeks. Um, but that's more for people with a, a higher acuity of mental health symptoms. They might be having thoughts of self-harm or they might just be deeply depressed or anxious or OCD, et cetera. So for your more well patients who just want to transition through whatever they're going through, once a week for three to four weeks is our standard package. And then we reassess and revisit and determine what might be a maintenance schedule if they need a maintenance schedule at all. Ideally, the goal for me is the less ketamine, the better. 
I love that. And, and I'm wondering, like, I know you said you're amassing data, but are there any practices that your patients have reported that seem to uh, help those ketamine effects be more durable? Um, I think, you know, integration is lifelong and you can do many things to integrate uh, to make those responses more durable. So I think ketamine assisted therapy where you can really create permanent shifts in the way you relate to your relationships, your own like um, thoughts, et cetera, can create permanent last long uh, like changes. Um, but there's also other tools that pa patients leverage um, to do so. And, you know, things like just holistic measures, integrative measures. An example of a patient who made those, just to make it really concrete, I had a patient who came in with 30 years of depression, was diagnosed as being treatment resistant depression. I actually suspect the patient was lifelong closeted with regard to their sexuality and never really dealt with the shame related to that. Went through a ketamine induction series and I think started to process some of that, as well as they were so depressed for so long, they weren't exercising, they weren't eating well, they weren't just doing very basic integrative things. The last, we didn't see that patient again for nine months after the induction series. This patient was chronically depressed for 30 years. We saw them once back, nine months later, they had lost 50 pounds. They were exercising regularly. They were sleeping well. All these integrative aspects had come online because ketamine had created the space for them to feel better. And they kind of got on the first rung of the ladder and then they just kept climbing the ladder with all these other tools. And so then they really didn't need the ketamine anymore. That's very nice. I love how that's, uh, that you have put a, a finer point on the fact that more ketamine is not generally the goal. The, the goal is an, just as much ketamine as needed to make that life change stick. And then whatever holistic practices, and very often it's not even a holistic practice. Like it may just be, now I'm eating healthy. It's not like I have to sit and do breath work or meditate all day long. It may be like you said, for that patient as basic as now I feel okay enough. I feel good enough to want to take care of my health by eating more healthy or by exercising just kind of basic self-care things that perhaps they were too depressed to address before. So I really appreciate you coming on talking about all of this because I think like you said, what in, and um, Arsalan and I were discussing this before the episode started is like, what, what do we call these? And we were, you know, he was talking about adjustment disorder as he was just uh, saying, which is basically just life. Like who in their life hasn't changed jobs, had a relationship end, had a relative or a friend pass away. Like there are so many things that happen that are absolutely just part of the human experience, but that are still difficult and that we don't have a lot of tools for addressing. And so I think this will speak to a lot of people who, you know, may have said, well, ketamine's not for me. I don't have a diagnosis of A, B, or C. So I really appreciate you coming on the show and bringing light to the fact that, you know, like you said, we don't have to pathologize everything. Sometimes life is hard. And, and, and I really appreciate that you brought to the fact that when that life adjustment stress doesn't get managed, that's the spectrum that at some other end can end in suicidal ideation. And so thank you for, maybe this even gives people the, people the permission to like, it, it, there, it is worth addressing what I know is just a regular life transition, but I am worthy of getting this addressed and trying to feel better and not just everybody says, oh, time will heal, right? Well, maybe there are some other things that might help that healing. So can you tell people where they can find you and your work and, and um, learn more about you and your clinic? Yeah. Yeah. So Daydream MD has two locations here in San Diego. You can find us at www.daydreammd.com. Um, you can also just Google it and, uh, we'd love to talk to patients. So feel free to reach out if you want support, even if you're not coming in for treatment, you just want some guidance. Uh, we're happy to provide people with information. You can also tell them your Instagram. Cause I, I always see very cool healing circles on your oh, Instagram. Sure. It's day underscore dream MD. Somebody else got to daydream. So yeah, it's day <laughs> underscore dream MD. On Instagram. Very nice. Well, I really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you for giving uh, me the platform, Lynn Marie. We really appreciate everything you're doing. Oh, thank you. All right. For everybody else out there, until next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a rating or review as it helps others find the show. And if you'd like to learn more, you can find the show notes at plantmedicine.org forward slash podcast. And there's information for clinicians at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Our incredible music was by the one and only Porangi. We'll see you next time.